And before we get started, a huge thanks to one of our newest top tier sponsors, April Air. Um, you're going to help your clients stay healthier with April Air. We've got humidity control, temperature control, air purity, water efficient humidification is a win for health and water conservation, energy efficient dehumidification pairs with a right sized heat pump system that'll keep you feeling cool uh, and keeping higher set points to save energy. We know it works. And then ultimately you're gonna plug in a MERV 13, maybe MERV 16 higher filtration from April Air. It's gonna capture particulates, especially ones of growing uh, concerns, such as ones that are uh, virus laden particulates or PM 2.5 from some of that increase in wildfire smoke, VOCs, dust, and more. They're gonna help you out, uh, breath, the fullness of life, breathe the fullness of life, aprilair.com, check them out uh, today. And then also thanks to our second tier sponsor, Water Furnace, some of the most energy efficient heat pump ground source geothermal systems on the planet out there, taking that natural uh, heating and cooling temperature out of the ground. You've got horizontal systems, vertical systems, uh, all sorts of ways you can drill and get the energy out of the ground. Real great for large uh, new construction projects, big multifamily projects, and neighborhood scale. We're starting to see the infrastructure get funded. Check them out over at waterfurnace.com. All right. Well, welcome everyone to Humidification Strategies for Residential Health. This course is brought to you by the Green Home Institute. Um, my name is Brett Little. I'm the program manager here, and I'll be your moderator today. Our mission is to empower people to make healthier and more sustainable choices in the places we live. This course is approved for many different continuing education units, um, as well as BPI, uh, as well as our own internal certified green home professional under the health pillar. So check that out. And as well as AIA, health, welfare, and safety, which may make it applicable to your state-based design or contractor license. So with that, I am super excited to hand it off to our guest speaker today, uh, Chris Howells. And he's going to tell you a little bit more about himself and April Air. And then we've also got um, Joe on the line here, who's going to be helping out with some different Q&A and then may pop in later at the end. So, Chris, please do take it away. All right. Well, thank you very much, Brett. It's an honor to be here with you all, whether it's morning or afternoon. We appreciate that. So while I'm getting my screen up here, hopefully you all are seeing it. Um, the opportunity to, to talk about humidification is at an all-time high for many different reasons, and the strategies that come behind that is, is very important for all of us to understand. So as we go through uh, the next 45 minutes to an hour or so, you know, as Brett alluded to, please open yourselves up with uh, the questions that you may have uh, from a technical nature, um, you know, understanding the reasons why. We, we wanna talk about the importance of humidification and especially with the health concerns that we have today. But just a quick introduction of myself and where I've been. Uh, I've been in the HVAC industry pretty much my whole life. Uh, the majority of my career still today was spent on the field side as a contractor. I was a service technician for 15 of those years and then kind of progressed as the uh, opportunities came to me. And I've been with April Air for six and a half years now. I've had a few different roles within the organization. I absolutely love what we get to do. We get to provide our, our knowledge, our education, our passion for creating healthier homes in aligning with the building industry and obviously the heating and cooling industry. So it's a pleasure to be with you all. And, and I always wanna start by saying thank you. Uh, it's an investment of your time. It's an investment of your day to think about how you can better yourselves to better your customer base or anybody that you touch in this indoor air quality industry. And we are extremely grateful for that. So thank you so much for your support and your partnership. Uh, we just continue to look forward to the success in creating healthier homes. And quite honestly, that's our vision and our mission. So jumping in, let's think about this because Families, maybe us individually, we make decisions throughout every day to become healthier. As a human, we do things like eat a balanced diet. We're going to drink more water. We're going to get out and exercise. Uh, we get a good night's sleep. Those are all very important attributes of building us in healthier uh, humans. 
And by the way, that creates the biggest and best defense against unhealthy sick air, including germs, viruses, and pollutants that are in our homes. And with many of us working from home, this percentage has been in the industry for a long time. I'm, I'm a little skeptical and see how much it climbs uh, from most of us being at home now where the environment around our body in our own homes is just as important as what we're doing to it to become healthier, the air that we breathe. So creating that healthier haven should be something that's at the forefront of our, of our building and our capabilities. Now facts are stubborn. And depending on what facts you read, sometimes they are very stubborn, but thinking about the air specifically, We've seen EPA state that the air inside your home is two to five times dirtier than the air outside your home. And as you're breathing that in, and uh, a recent study by Hopkins Medicine states that we take 12 to 16 breaths per minute at normal respiratory rates. So if you extrapolate that out a little bit, that's 720 breaths per hour and almost 20,000 breaths per day. What are we putting into our bodies? So that's where we need to start understanding a little bit more than uh, just, are we heating a home? Are we cooling a home? What are we trying to accomplish? Now, 79, 70, and 50, these are interesting numbers because the average person lives to be 79 years old. 70 of those years are spent indoors and 50 of those years are spent in our own homes. So we really need to be thinking about breathing that fresh, clean, healthy air in our home. And there's 30 million pollutants potentially in one cubic foot of air. I mean, think about for that for a second in the cubic volume of a home. So these facts are stubborn, but often true. And there's nothing new. Uh, we've been getting beat up for years on uh, losing these battles. We know cold and flu season's right around the, the corner here as we start to transition into that fall and that winter season, upper respiratory infections. 94% um, of respiratory problems come from polluted air. Uh, so very important. Dust mites and issues with high humidity, not the point of conversation today, but those things are losing battles every day in our homes. VOCs. As we build tighter, more energy efficient homes, we have to consider what the volatile organic compound or the chemical off-gassing that's occurring in our homes. And then dry, itchy skin. Uh, as we heat the air, and we're gonna get into this in very specific terms of why do we start to dry out in the winter months? I posed the question of these organizations in what they manufacture for consumers? And the, the answer to that question is they don't produce any specific product, but what they do is they study. They study so to support our industry so we understand what has been proven to work in homes and buildings, in combating infectious disease and unhealthy air. ASHRAE is the leading forefront and when they partner with universities and, and other organizations to study the air in, in a home or a business, that's where April Air really looks to support what we do and how we do it in educating. We wanna know what's been proven to work. ASHRAE standard designations drive that. And a healthy air system is not one product. Indoor air quality is not one product. There's many, pieces to the puzzle that we have to put together in creating a healthier environment in our home. High efficient filtration, as Brett's mentioned earlier, are we talking about a MERV 13, maybe a MERV 16, if we've got high concerns of particulate in the home. Humidity control, not only from the humidification that we're going to focus in on today, but dehumidification and the importance that that provides. And then fresh air ventilation. The industry is really stated for health attributes, you should really be focusing in on this complete holistic approach to the indoor environment. At some point in time, I'm sure over the last 18 months of, of this pandemic, 
time that we're in, you've probably seen or have read or studied this for yourself, how viruses are transmitted. And in understanding the differences from that airborne element in what and how a virus can infect it, uh, us and cause us to become sick. So that droplet, it starts from you and I, and it's spread by when we're talking, uh, when we're coughing, sneezing, uh, laughing, uh, anything that can release this particulate into the air, these droplets. But what's really, really important is what that relative humidity level is and how that virus is going to interact in the air once it's been introduced to the air. So that virus has a lipid that's, that's encompassed in it that will shrink very quickly if the air is dry in a home or building, which means it becomes very light and it stays in the air for a long time. I was reading recently that a virus uh, micron level can stick into the air of upwards of 13 days. So it's very important that we control that aspect, but also the humidity. Because when we allow proper relative humidity in a home, those viruses, they don't have that ability to stay in the air. They're actually heavier and they'll fall to the ground where it's not going to have as much of an impact as it would if it was in the air where you and I breathe. I mentioned earlier our human defense against this unhealthy, sick air in a home. And these are just some bullet point facts to understand how our bodies react. I, I think about this for a second. In just 15 minutes of exposure to dry air, our cells have already started to break down and show signs of weaknesses. Take that out a little bit longer eight hours of exposure. So think about when we sleep at night. Hopefully we're getting right around that eight hours of sleep. When we're exposed to environment of 20% relative humidity or less, we are considered clinically dehydrated now. 50% relative humidity is the best relative humidity for our immune system, but we're gonna talk about that percentage in relation to regionality and expectations and compromises that we have to understand within a home. And then as I mentioned, 20% is when your immune system is impaired. So a healthy lifestyle is gonna boost our immune system, but we really have to understand the importance the air around us provides. So humidity in our health, as a I mentioned viruses and bacteria struggle to survive in these humid environments. They become significantly less transferable. And a human biological defense is our mucous membranes. And this is interesting to think about. Uh, I always allude to if you sleep with your mouth open and you wake up in the morning and you're, you're gasping for air because your throat's all dried out. Well, you became a humidifier in the middle of the night because that dry air has completely sucked the moisture out of you. Now your protective membrane is broken down and if there's unhealthy polluted air in your home and you're ingesting that during a inhale, now it's, it's even deeper into your cells and can greatly impact you much quicker. So understanding that environment inside our own homes is so important in becoming healthier. Question, Brett? Yeah, um, just to, to clarify, can you speak to um, relative humidity and dew point, unless you already plan on doing that, but just how that, if those are the same thing and how those play a role versus just, you know, overall humidity as far as yeah. issues and viral transfer? No, that that's a great question. And that'll kind of go into that psychrometric and how we look and why we talk about relative humidity versus true dew points and temperature relations. Mm -hmm. So if I can maybe answer that here in a couple slides. Yeah. And then the other question is, um, you know, as far as uh, airborne viruses and dry air, and I know, you know, that's in that conversation too. Is it just that they're just that they're airborne longer, or is it that they actually, you can catch them easier just given the situation, the stress on your body, 
And then do they potentially impact you worse if you do catch them in dry air? I've heard all sorts of things. What, what have you seen or heard out there? Yeah, I think the, the, the relevance to the question is it's that, it's that holistic approach because if it yeah. stays in the air longer and it's lighter and we have airflow, the next step in that is we want to be able to capture that particulate. And that's where the filtration side comes in. Mm-hmm. But that, that comes into understanding the whole dynamic of the envelope and what we're doing inside a home and how quickly that air is moving or what we call an air change per hour. And we can look at that air change per hour based on filtration numbers. And we can also look at that number based on fresh air ventilation numbers as well. But really kind of going back to that one slide that showed that that person expelling that droplet, the fact that it can either really quickly fall to the ground and not have as much of an impact to me spreading it to you versus it shrinking really quickly in an air. And I mean, we're talking about milliseconds and where this this happens mm-hmm. where it stays in the airborne longer and then it's it's easily transferred mm-hmm. great thanks absolutely good questions great questions and we you know we see this cold and flu season come and go and we know that the highest rates of these upper respiratory infections, colds and flus happens between November and April. And that's when our relative humidity inside our homes are at its lowest. So when we go into a home and we're taking moisture measurements, and one of those would be a psychrometer that you see in the picture there, there's other methods of measuring moisture, maybe within uh, wood, that would tell you your, your, your moisture level of wood and how much it's either releasing or absorbing. But we know that this happens and that comes into the element of when we heat the home and what happens and why. And really quickly, before we get into a little bit more of that technical conversation, this is what the research professionals have been saying in in aligning with maybe more of your question, Brett, and what happens. And Dr. Stephanie Taylor has been very vocal uh, going back to last year with the pandemic and looking and studying and what works and and really bringing that up in our industry and educating on the importance of controlling humidity. And that's that's the studies that we wanna focus in on in what has been proven in homes and businesses. If we look at what ASHRAE looks at and what they recommend, this is an ASHRAE comfort chart and it boils down to what indoor pollution and triggers and how it reacts to relative humidity percentages and moisture percentages, right? And if you look here, you see your list, bacteria, viruses, allergic asthma reactions, and you can go down the list. And you can see how they, they tail off as we start to hit that optimized comfort window of 40 to 60% relative humidity. So when we're targeting a specific range of humidity, we need the controllability. And that's where the building envelope will really drive how we achieve that with humidification and dehumidification, because this is a compromise. There isn't just one system that we can go put in a home and know that we have complete control variabilities from both the humidification side and dehumidification side. We need to have, we need to look at that from both sides. We need to look at humidifying and dehumidifying. So when we take this measurement in a home, understanding what potential impact from the health and the comfort it has, and that's a measurable number with that psychrometer. We can can look at this. And what are those impacts? And these are pictures. I love pictures from the field. Some of these I've taken, some of these I've just taken from the good old Google. But these are the results of what happens in a home with dry air. You've got crown molding that shrinks and you've got the gap in the upper left hand corner there. You know, doors all of a sudden that were sticking just a little while ago, they start closing much easier. We've got beautiful pianos and woodwork throughout our house and that has to be maintained at a specific relative humidity for for preservation and protection. And then you got the thermal imaging. And, And I want not to focus in on the thermal imaging so much, But understand when you see thermal imaging, how it kind of gives that x-ray of a home, 
Now we know how outdoor elements can start to have an impact on indoor environments. Meaning if it's really cold and dry outside and you've got that warmer home, how is that infiltration or in other season seasonality, the exfiltration of a home impacting our environment? Meaning are we facilitating dry air or are we facilitating humid air in a home, depending on where we're at from the environmental side. And there was a there was a study done by the Idaho Forest Products Commission in just think about this for a second that bottom left picture that shows a home being built and construct an average 2000 square foot home can decrease by 32,000 pounds during a heating season, which means it can also increase by that same weight in the summer months. Hey, right, Chris, question? yeah, a couple, if you want to go back to the psychometric chart there, a um, couple of questions kind of starting from the top down to the bottom here. Um, so the, the, um, the virus is, you know, obviously, right, big issue with dry air, but it seems to pick back up again, um, somewhere around 70. What do you know about that as far as a, you know, viruses being too humid um, or is that a mistake on the chart as someone was asking? Yeah, I don't think it's a mistake on the chart by any means. Yeah. Um, and, and quite honestly, I can't speak to how the survival rate of the virus specifically, how it increases back up and especially mm -hmm. as we get towards 100% relative humidity yeah. um, on this chart, uh, because this is an ASHRAE standard chart this isn't an april air chart that's put together um so yeah my apologies on the increase of relative humidity in relation to viruses yeah. uh, i don't know if joseph uh, he's my tag team partner on here if, if he has any experience from that side but i can tell you definitely from that that low humidity and how it survives mm -hmm. yeah i think it was um um, if I recall back to a session we did with Ty Newell, um, over at build Equinox, I yeah. believe it was Ronavirus RH. It was a special type of virus that you get that comes out, rears its ugly head in the, in the summertime when things are humid. That's, that's what I'm recalling anyway, but, uh, someone would have to fact check me on that one. So, um, yeah, these, these viruses anymore, they're, you know, it's such an interesting topic and, yeah it boils down to the science, right? And, right? and how these things survive in our environments and how we control them. And, and that's what our home, you know, you think about a home and, and why it was designed. It was designed to protect us right. uh, from the elements. <laughs> right. But then as we've kind of created more and more and more of an environment, now this controlled environment, you know, looking at what the studies have proven to create that, that healthier indoor environment. Yeah, I, just, I, I was just gonna add that same point that, you know, viruses, both when you're talking about what the best conditions for them are, but also the size, you know, viruses come in, in, in many different sizes. So that's why sometimes when we talk about, well, this is the perfect size for viruses, it's probably the perfect size for the majority of viruses, but they're going to come in, um, you know, PM 2.5 is a great starting point, but they're going to be all over the map. So again, that's why we really focus on the fact that they live uh, for the most part with inside these water droplets that come out of our body. That's, that's why we're measuring them at the size that we are. I did right. want to um, Someone mentioned it too, but this is not the psychometric chart, but just a um, yeah. <laughs> map uh, that's yeah. put out by Ashray. With the psychometric chart, um, you'll know it when you see it. It's a little more right. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, uh, I, I, I made a mistake there, so thanks. I, I regret my mistake. So, um, moving down real quick, uh, chemical interactions, and just to clarify that these VOCs that sort of come from our um, you know, our, our furniture and, and whatever, our flooring, that's really an issue more at the higher end of the scale, right? It's not really so yeah. much a problem when you're dry. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You could see how that, that tail kind of gets thicker as you go towards that higher relative humidity and, and definitely, and how those chemicals and much like what Joseph just said, you know, yeah. what kind of chemical and how does it react? And right. From the studies, 30% is kind of that baseline where they start to interact a little bit more. And again, this chart is referencing how does it impact you and I as humans? I think it's also referenced as a sterling chart. Right. 
Well, and, and, and speaking of interact, you know, the curious one, and I'm, I know I've seen this one a hundred times, but I've just been thinking a lot about ozone, especially because it's, you know, been warmer and we've been getting hit with ozone more often. And I see though ozone seems to be more of an issue on the, on the drier side. Uh, interestingly enough, if I'm reading this correct, um, which then I don't believe usually it's such a bad issue during the winter, but any thoughts there? Yeah, I, I think it comes into, um, you, I, what I'm interested in knowing from that ozone production too right. is, is what is the chart referencing from the production standpoint? Because we have natural ozone right outside and mm. what is being created within a home that that ozone production level kind of tails off as we increase humidity versus where it's increased. So I think you bring up really good points, Brett, that we could do further studying on in knowing what each individual trigger and how it's how it's related to the relative humidity specific. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I know we got a lot to talk about with humidification, so we'll let you move on, Chris. Thanks. <laughs> oh, great questions. I love it. And, and again, this is why I love these education platforms, because, you know, we, we can learn just as much, if not more than what you all, because, you know, that's where we get to come together and rise up together. Question uh, I get asked a lot of times, mostly from the contractors, is give me some reasons why our customers need humidifiers. You know, a lot of times it comes down to the basic, I've got dry, itchy skin, or uh, I know it's lunchtime here in the Eastern. If you're eating lunch, I apologize about the girl with the bloody nose. But, you know, we know that dry, itchy skin, bloody noses, those are key components to low indoor relative humidity and static electricity. Um, I love the picture of the cat too. So understanding how it impacts us, not only from just the physical feel standpoint, but also from that internal infectious uh, controllability. And these are just some bullet points I put together, uh, sometimes from asking customers questions of, you know, do you experience any of these things? And that's where you start to understand, uh, okay, there is more to humidification than just, I got dry static uh, electricity in my home or that dry edgy skin. There's that key components of the health that we have to understand, whether it's virus mitigation specifically, but what affects you individually and how do we create a healthier environment for you and your family? And that includes pets too, we gotta include them. So those are just some bullet points. And again, you can find all of these in that hand uh, handout that Brett has put into the chat. So thank you for doing that as well. So let's start talking a little technical here because why does the air in a home dry out during the heating season? And we think about this from a consumer approach. Oftentimes, if we get cold, we do one of two things. We either bundle up in our own homes or we go to the thermostat and we turn up temperature, not even really thinking and considering What's the relation to the moisture level inside the house that is being directly impacted from those implications outside, as I mentioned in that thermal imaging? So that was just a snapshot that I, that I took. Uh, I believe I was down in uh, Georgia, excuse me, when I saw that. And it, it showed how, hey, if you have an indoor temperature of 70 degrees and the outdoor dew point, so this is kind of leading into now more of that true moisture in the air of zero degrees, the potential indoor relative humidity is going to be single digits. And that is completely uncomfortable. It's unhealthy and it does no value to your home in protection, protecting the assets that are in it as well. Why do we talk about this relative humidity and what is it? And oftentimes this is the simplest, easiest way to understand moisture is because oftentimes the meteorologists, they focus in on a temperature and a humidity, and you kind of know if it's going to be hot and humid, you know you're going to be very uncomfortable. So let's break down relative humidity in understanding what it is first. It's a, it's a vapor. It's going to act like a gas. It's going to rise throughout a hole. And that, I love putting the analogy to just a boiling pot of water on the stove. That steam, it rises and it eventually becomes absorbed into the air. 
And this is true to a home and what's called the stack effect of a home and how that moisture at the lowest level, if it's the highest, is, is rising up, trying to hit an equilibrium. And that's another important measurement to remember is where our homes are, are always trying to reach this equilibrium point, whether it's temperature, it's humidity, it's pressure. And that brings us to the psychrometric chart. So the true psychrometric chart and what it tells us, how do we use it? Why do we even use it? And there's many different ways in the HVAC industry that we can reference this chart from a technical standpoint of setting up economizers on rooftop units. We can drill down to the total heat formula and actually calculating out how many BTUs an air conditioning system is putting out right then and there. But the basic principle of understanding psychrometrics, which dates back to the early 1900s with Willis Carrier, was how do we look at this environment, the science behind heating, cooling, and controlling moisture in a home? And that's what a psychrometric chart drives towards. Now, just a little psychrometric 101. This is normally a farther, greater detailed class. But you've got two points of, of reference on this chart. And then you see two shaded areas. This is what we call the comfort window. So depending on where we fall in this window or outside this window is gonna determine how we feel in relation to temperature and relative humidity. Because taking a step back, relative humidity is the moisture, the amount of moisture in the air versus how much it can hold at 100%. It's just a reference, but it's simple. That's easy to understand. Knowing really how much water is in the air is that technical approach that we have to understand when we're talking about humidifying a home and dehumidifying a home. So I've got two points of reference that I was able to gather from a psychrometer, whether it's an old school sling psychrometer or one of the new school digital ones. The, Sorry about that. The first line, the red line, represents what we call our dry bulb temperature. So that's the temperature that we see on our thermostats. Now I can't move anywhere vertically on that line unless I have another point of reference, most commonly known as relative humidity. So once I've got those two measurements, that's the blue line, which also, if you look closely at the chart, it starts at the bottom and it kind of swoops up towards the top. That's your relative humidity relation to the chart. Now that's great, but you can see I'm at both ends of that comfort window there. So my body is gonna feel very similar based on what those temperature and the relative humidity is. But that really doesn't put in perspective what the moisture level is in the home. And that's gonna be your green line. So to answer your question earlier, Brett, about dew point, that's that green line designation because if you're familiar with the psychrometric chart, on the right-hand side there, you've got your dew point uh, representation numbers, but then you also have your grains per pound. And that's when we can start to understand water content versus relative humidity. The amount of water that's in the air versus how much it can hold versus the actual amount of water that is really in air. And if you look at the differential between those green lines, that's a substantial difference in how we are going to feel if we were to break that down to a dew point. Because that bottom number is roughly, I don't know, we'll call it 38 degrees dew point. The upper number is the mid 60s, so 64, 63, 64, somewhere in that range. Well, that's a dramatic feeling difference for us as humans. Our bodies become an evaporation method. If it's very dry, we're gonna start releasing, we're gonna feel cooler. It's almost a wind chill effect. Versus if I have a higher dew point, it's almost like putting a blanket on. You're insulating, you're feeling warmer and better. Now there's a compromise because we don't wanna be too high because we're gonna be very uncomfortable. I like elementary. I love simplicity. How do we really relate this to me and how do I how am I able to explain this um, to, to somebody that might not even understand psychometrics? And that's where the ASHRAE 522 talks about in looking at human comfort with psychometrics. So going back to that comfort zone on the left-hand side there of the screen, 
you can see how my body as a human is going to feel depending on where my, my test points are on that chart. Am I going to feel cold and dry? Am I going to feel humid? Am I going to feel hot and humid? And by the way, we can even use this on a regional basis because up in Madison, where Joseph's at, Madison, Wisconsin, is going to feel completely different depending on the season than somebody maybe in Phoenix, Arizona, where it's very dry but hot. So how we move around on these charts can simply help you and I understand where comfort goes between temperature, relative humidity, and absolute humidity. Bringing it into more of an analytical, um, or excuse me, uh, analogizing it from a, a, a cylinder so we can visually see this because if we look at temperature and humidity, they're a relation. If I increase temperature, I increase the volume of the air. So I want you to start thinking about a home and as we heat a home, as we heat a home, the dynamic of the air starts to increase, the volume increases. If I take that same water measurements, so you see that 12 grains per pound. So I didn't change the amount of water that was in the air but I did change the volume or our temperature. So from a 70 degree to a 30 degree, the amount of water in the air is the same, but you could see how that relative humidity is very different. 50% at 30 degrees versus 12% at 70 degrees. So when we think about heating and cooling a home, how's that impacting the RH percentage is directly correlated to the relationship. But I love this because I was challenged once in, in the field by somebody that was far greater and far smarter than me. And he said, well, help me understand why does the air dry out? And I went to exactly what I just explained to you all. Well, the volume increases. And he goes, Chris, that's right, but that's not the answer. And I said, huh, all right, help me understand so I can get better. And he goes, think about the basic thermal dynamics of air. You know, warm air is going to migrate to cold air, humid to dry. Humid air, as I mentioned earlier, is lighter than dry air. It's going to rise. And then that high pressure is seeking low pressure. So they're all trying to achieve an equilibrium point to get to a net neutral. However, what happens from a molecular level, and I think this kind of goes back to the ASHRAE comfort chart in how different airborne triggers are reacting in a home, a lot of it has to do here because as we heat the air, our molecules at the molecular level start to move very fast. So they're colliding together and they're exerting force which is taking your water molecules with them and absorbing them and eventually drying that air out versus air that is very cool or cold where those molecules don't move, they don't collide very much, there's not a lot of force behind them. So they're gonna actually attract and raise relative humidity. So from the deepest and darkest technical avenues that I can provide to you all, when we heat the home and at our highest temperature output, we've got molecules moving very, very fast versus when we cool that air where they're moving very, very slow and how that dries the air out and also increases the humidity in the home. <clears throat> so temperature and relative humidity. <laughs> if all things are equal and I have 70 degrees and I have a 50% relative humidity, the only way I can decrease it down to 12% is I have to remove water. I have to be able to get water out of there and vice versa. If I have 70 degrees and I'm at 12% relative humidity, how do I get it to 50%? The only way I can do it is by physically adding water to the air. And I wanna caution because there might be some perception to adding water to the air and the negativity that that might have. And that's gonna kind of go into where we start to talk about what kinds of humidifiers and how do they perform and how do they produce the, that water level of increasing relative humidity. So bear with me, we're getting there. So as I mentioned, this is how we get there. We have to dehumidify to lower the relative humidity. We have to humidify to raise the relative humidity. There's no other way around it. That's it. That's the plain and simple answer to that. So if I go back to that ASHRAE comfort chart 
in thinking about relative humidity as a compromise, I wanna to try to create the healthiest environment within a home. There's a compromise though, because if I'm in Minnesota, I don't want a 50% relative humidity inside my home when it's 10 degrees or zero degrees outside because I'm gonna have all kinds of issues with condensation on my window and dew points. And that's gonna to lead to all kinds of negativity in the home. And at the same time, if I'm in you know, Miami, Florida, I, I don't want a real high relative humidity percentage. I wanna be able to bring that down into an ex acceptable level because that's gonna impact comfort and the, and the health and the preservation of the home. So we recommend 30 to 45% in the winter months. And we also recommend 45 to 60% in the summer months. And that's gonna be compromised from regionality to seasonality and how we get there. So something to consider in a season of a major pandemic that we've been in and continue to be in, there's been a lot of products out there that have been making claims on virus mitigation, and that's what they do. And whether they're a fact or opinion or, or somewhere in between, that's, not, that's neither here nor say right now. But a whole home humidifier is a virus mitigation solution, but it also has a lot more attributes in building that healthier home, building that more comfortable and preserved home. And that's something that's really important from a value proposition. What are you offering and how are you achieving that? And what has been proven to work in a home, in a building? Choosing the right humidifier, understanding what the right amount of moisture and how do we get there is to a home. And you could see we've got a couple different designations that you you may or may not be familiar with and how we increase the relative humidity through a humidifier. In a ASHRAE technical term, there is a adiabatic unit, which is more commonly known as an evaporative style humidifier. And then there's the isotherm units, which is commonly known as steam units. So even taking that psychometric chart and breaking it down a little bit more, that's what that center chart is referencing there to say, how do we get from that temperature to that relative humidity as quickly as possible and as effectively as possible? And there's, that's not a right or wrong approach to the right humidifier, but there are some key attributes that we have to understand. One of them being regionality. My approach to making a recommendation on the right humidifier in say, Northern Illinois and the Chicago land market might be completely different than what it is, say, in the desert Southwest. Desert Southwest, we have to provide humidification even during the cooling season because of the air already being so dry out there. So we've got, we've got homes out there that humidify and air condition at the same time. We would never think about doing that, uh, whether we're here in the Midwest or maybe in the Northeast especially down south. If, if you're joining us from Miami, Florida, thank you. I appreciate that. But you're probably not thinking about humidifiers too much down there. You have that natural humidification. Um, so understanding that from a regional and what provides the best performance. And then it breaks down to understanding the environment of the home, whether this is on new construction or this is existing. Th these dynamics don't change. There's a, a sizing guideline that we can provide that you can reference and look at this and say, okay, I know based on my home, let's just use an example of a 2000 square foot home. Now I look at how many air changes per hour that I'm creating in that home. So a tighter home has less air changes per hour versus a loose home where I'm moving that air quite a bit because I'm probably having to conditioning it, which means I'm going to need more gallons per day to maintain a specific relative humidity percentage. So if I use an average home, I need 17 gallons per day to maintain an indoor environment of 30% relative humidity at a 20 degree outdoor temperature. So that's when we look at our sizing guideline and how we're driving to make sure that we provide the right level of humidity. There is no right answer to that number. It's not a specific number. It's gonna be based on environment or excuse me, in the re regional climate and that outdoor relationship to the indoor environment. 
if I wanted to drill down even deeper to knowing exactly how many gallons per day I needed to my home, there is a calculation out there. It gets a little complex. It gets really down into understanding the, the, the volume of air and the specifics of air, but know that that's, that's there if you really want to drive it down. But this is a great point of reference that will get you close enough to where you need to be. And one thing I should make note of right here before I, um, before I move on, we cannot oversize a humidifier when it's properly controlled. So if I have a home that is, excuse me, I'm gonna go back to this one more time. If I have a home that's loose and I need a lot of capacity to raise that relative humidity, so to actually physically add the water to the air, I might have to look at something that can produce or is capable or multiple units in some cases, because I'm just gonna raise the relative humidity faster because I have that, that, that level of production. But if I undersize a humidifier, that's where a lot of times the humidifier just continues to run, it has an energy impact and it doesn't do the job that it needs to do to create that environment inside the home. So as I mentioned, we cannot oversize a humidifier when it's properly controlled, but we can undersize a humidifier. So make sure you're, you're referencing the right charts, you're looking at the home and the environment to know what does that home need to be able to maintain the specifics of the relative humidity that you, uh, you're attempting to get. Now on the evaporative side, you'll see on the picture in the bottom left, that's called a fan powered humidifier. It's mounted on the supply duct. It could be also mounted on the return, uh, but we show it as our recommended solution on the supply. And that has a fan that's gonna draw air in through a water panel that's saturated by water. It creates a humidification and then draws it back into the airflow that is then blended and conditioned and mixed throughout the whole home. The other side is what we call a bypass humidifier. Now that's drawing air, it's using just the air between the negative side and the positive side of your HVAC equipment to draw that air through it and evaporated it and then condition it back in. So application-based, regionality-based, also from a capacity, because if you look at the chart in the middle there, you could see a reference from a small bypass in how many gallons per day it can handle. So that goes back to referencing it to the sizing chart. If I needed 17 gallons a day to maintain that 35% at 20 degrees, I don't want to size a small bypass because even at a higher temperature, I'm not reaching that 17 gallons a day. I might have to go to a large bypass. 17 minimum, I can get up to 22 gallons a day based on my, um, my temperature of my equipment that's being produced. And then finally, you've got a steam humidifier where here is where you really can ramp up your capacity and provide a viable solution in a lot of applications. I don't wanna say every application, but you can see from the sizing chart there, we can cover a lot of capacity and a lot of volume of air with one steam humidifier. And it's driven off of power. So volts and amps equals power. If we maximize the performance and the water quality, and we generate steam. And how we do that is through what we call electrode-based canister. So you can see the canister there in the middle. We fill it with water, and then we energize those electrodes, and we start to get that steam production, and then it's distributed through the home, through the HVAC equipment. So very effective, very natural production, by the way. This is the most natural method, but there is uh, some requirements from the installation side, the power side, because again, we want to maximize the production of that steam humidifier. So whether you have a complete ducted central system, the steam humidifier can adapt to that, or on the right-hand side there, maybe you have a home that's a boiler. It has no forced air, or a lot of homes now that, that are getting super energy efficient, they don't even have ductwork. Well, we have a fan pack system that you can also incorporate to the home that is going to provide that steam humidification throughout the home.
just a couple pictures from the field, just so you can see if you, if you have a basement system, both of those pictures are from the basements. The one on the left, you're seeing the steam humidifier mounted on the wall. You'll see that black tube, which is the steam tube, goes over to the supply duct. And that is where this, the steam is then conditioned and mixed and blended throughout the whole home with my HVAC equipment. The one on the right there, if you look in the upper right corner, that's that fan powered humidifier. And that's a very effective way of also providing the humidification with those environments where we can accept that capacity and from a uh, installation standpoint as well. Controlling it. Controlling it's just as important uh, as the system design because if we don't have the right control, we're never going to achieve what we need to achieve. And there's different methods. There's automatic controls that are looking at a calculation of outdoor temperature to indoor relative humidity and using that relationship. You have a thermostat that has the capabilities of also driving humidity in your home and what you have the controllability if it's a Wi-Fi based thermostat. And then you've got the good old manual control, which if we go back to the early days of humidification, you just drove to a specific percentage and that's, that's what it is. And, and if it can achieve it, great. If not, it, it doesn't. Uh, question there, Brett? Um, well, if, you, if you're going to get into it, but yeah, specific to um, accuracy of these measurements, uh, which I assume is, you know, inherent in these controls. And then, you know, also where, where also should you be taking, you know, humidity measurements in the house or should it just be within the thermostat? Yeah, like, great question. So thank you for bringing that up. When you look at what the control placement is and where you're measuring that humidity at, the auto control and the manual control should be mounted on the central return of the HVAC equipment. So if you've got a full-fledged uh, central AC system, the reason why is you're getting a complete blend through the return era from the whole home. So that's a very effective way of measuring what the whole home relative humidity is. Now you also can take that, you see that dial control that's on the screen there. If you're targeting a specific area that you expect the relative humidity to be a specific percentage in that area, then you could take that control or a thermostat that has the capabilities, mount it there, and it's gonna measure the relative humidity at that specific area. But the auto control gives you a good blend of the whole home environment versus it's more of a central location, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I do want to make a quick plug. Uh, November 3rd, 2021, we're going to be talking about uh, air quality metric um, and measuring them all throughout the house, different levels, uh, relative humidity dew point. So tune in for that. And we'll answer this question there a little bit more too. So thanks. <laughs> Perfect. Good plug. Good plug. Yeah. So just kind of in, in wrapping up the control side and just a couple more slides and then we'll open it up for the Q&A. Um, what is the right relative humidity? And I get this question again all the time from the field. What should I tell my customers? Well, you should really tell them the right answer is it's all based on what the outdoor relative or excuse me, the outdoor temperature is to make your recommended humidity recommendation. But you can also look at this chart. You can kind of think, think from where you're at in, in the region and say, okay, my outdoor temperature doesn't get below 30 degrees. So I know if I'm in that 40%, I'm going to probably be pretty safe because you can see as the outdoor temperature rises, my indoor relative humidity recommendation also rises. So that's where you can take this and say, use an auto control that drives that already for you, where it's more of a set it and forget it, let it do its job, or you can use the manual control and really it's up to you or the homeowner to drive where that relative humidity should be. So how do we get that outdoor temperature accuracy? There is a outdoor temperature sensor that would typically come with an auto control or even a thermostat to drive that accuracy of what you're truly measuring outside. And then as I mentioned, uh, we're in a, in, in a world of everything at the click of a button at our hand anymore. And that's no different with humidification controls or really from an IEQ standpoint, just to kind of piggyback off of Brett's plug. How do we control the environment in a home and knowing what's going on to be able to drive that operation? And whether it's controlling your humidifier, dehumidifier, your air filtration system, fresh air, temperature, 
You know, there's a lot of really good controls out there that will drive that for you and simplify everything. So just a couple good rules to follow, just some, some takeaways. If I had to make some recommendations for y'all to make sure that, you know, humidifiers are doing what they're supposed to be doing and you're maximizing the performance and providing that health and that comfort and preservation is you can see there, just make sure from the, from the application standpoint that you're picking whether it's a powered humidifier or the evaporative um, bypass type is effective for your market and for your applications. Or you can always look at the steam. We've seen steam really rise up because people know they can rely on it and what it's doing and how it's working. And it's very, very effective at how it does it. Um, and then make, making sure from the control strategy that you're, that you're maximizing the control potential to drive that humidity to achieve that expectation. And then always use the genuine OEM replacements on, on the maintenance size, whether it's a water panel, as you can see in the top right, or the canister. Uh, just make sure you're using genuine parts. There's a lot of, of knockoffs out there, and it just creates so much headaches from not meeting capacity, voiding warranties. Um, I've heard some really bad horror stories from water leakage and, and other things like that. So please make sure you're educating yourself, make sure you're educating your potential customers and whoever you deal with, that they use the right product in their, in their maintenance side of their equipment. So thank you so much. Um, and I know that was a lot to cover in, in a short amount of time. And understand that April Air backs all of our products on the humidifiers all the way across our complete portfolio by five years. Um, and, and we're gonna stay on here. If there's questions, Brett, I'll let you kind of lead that and we can go from there. So thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you uh, so much, Chris. And I have to say, I, uh, I um, caught the part about you mentioning steam rising up and, and I don't know how much you thought put into that, but <laughs> I got a little chuckle there. So thanks yeah. for that one. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, real quick for those of you who need to get going, I know we are at our time as far as continuing ed. So as long as you've been here for the full 60 minutes, you have to meet a full 60 minutes to be approved. Uh, you are dismissed. You can get going if you have to go. Otherwise, please stick around. We got a lot of great conversation ahead. We got a lot of great questions. We're going to be asking some more in-depth questions of Chris here. So please do stick around. For those of you watching this in the future, not right now on demand, please go ahead and take that quiz, get an 80% passing rate. And that's on our Thinkific channel, our USGBC channel, wherever you're watching, whatever channel in the future, and you'll get your certificate. For those of you watching here right now, live with us today, check your spam over the next couple of days, certs at gutenbergcerts.com, mark it as safe. And as long as you were here for the full 60 minutes for your CU approval, you'll be good. You'll get it and you'll be good to go. And as always, before we get into those questions coming in, a huge thanks to our board of directors, our volunteers, our new executive director, Jose Reina, and all of our top tier sponsors who are helping you build better, healthier, greener homes. Mitsubishi Electric, Ream, um, Build Equinox, CERV, Panasonic, and now April Air, all helping you make a better home, a better um, project. So check them all out if you haven't. So um, yeah, there are uh, a, a lot of great conversation, a lot of great questions. I wanna get um, over to uh, a conversation here about um, relative humidity versus dew point and which one we should be using. Um, you know, uh, the question kind of here is as an industry, where's the focus? I understand occupants can be uh, challenged as far as maybe having conversation with consumers, but as an industry, we keep talking about a moving target. So I actually can't tell from this comment where they land, but just speak a little bit about relative humidity versus dew point and, and the terminology we should be using. Yeah, the, the relation of what most consumers understand first. So let's, let's speak to that first. It's, mm -hmm. it's a temperature variance. And why I state that is we're, we're all comfortable at different measurements in what we feel. Now, the dew point ultimately is, is where we get to that comfort factor of what we're feeling. Uh, even though it's, it's a measurement, right? But it's extrapolated off of what the temperature and the relative humidity is. Mm -hmm. And that will, again, goes back into that graph, the psychometric chart, 
where you had that green line. And if we drove, if we drew that green line out, depending on where I fall on that right hand side of that chart would designate the dew point measurement. And that dew point measurements becomes mm. somewhat complex to understand because from an industry side, we've talked temperature and we've talked relative humidity till it's literally blue in the face, mm. but we haven't really talked about dew point. So it gets oftentimes a little confusing at the consumer level. I think from an industry level, we, we should all understand how important dew point plays in that, but it all comes right from temperature and relative humidity. Mm. Any uh, thing to add on to that, Joe, or? No, no, not that specific issue. I was going to chime in on another one when we're done with that one. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, so then, yeah, why don't you go ahead? So Chris, there were, there were a couple of questions that I think ultimately are kind of related. Um, in many ways, they're due to maintenance and I think installation application um, and also just whole home in general. So I'll kind of knock them off one by one and, and, and please add to it. Someone said that they have a client that wants humidity only in one room. Uh, so, you know, how would they do that? Now, obviously a portable would achieve that in the sense that the humidity would only be delivered in a single room. But as you talked about, I think it's important to mention that uh, A, that humidity level really should be the same probably throughout the house because most people are gonna wanna be within that band. Um, but beyond that, you know, you talked about that balance and that equilibrium. So really there's, there's not gonna be a, a huge opportunity to have drastically different humidity in one room than another one just by using a portable unit, correct? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, when you think about, you think about how we're targeting and where we're targeting and how do we achieve that in portables, uh, you think about going to the doctor and what do we know that they're going to write you a prescription. And, and if you got a cold or a flu, they're going to say, Hey, do you have a humidifier? And if not, they're going to tell you to go. And, and even the retail channels, you, you see it every year, you get these end caps that start building with humidifiers and dehumidifiers. I mean, they know, they know what's coming on there. But approaching it from a whole home, you know, approach versus a singular room approach is much more viable. It creates an environment that that is healthy throughout all of your home. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, uh, again, along those same lines, um, and, and it came up and, and we're happy to talk to it. You know, uh, there's always concerns about mold, right? Anytime you're introducing moisture, water into the environment, that's obviously going to be an issue. The question was specifically about, you know, uh, mold within the humidifier um, or the plenum or, or air handler itself as a result of the humidifier. And, you know, really what that's going to come down to, and Chris, you already mentioned it, that, you know, we can't over humidify with the correct controls. And that, that really is what it's all going to be about. I think we have technology that is greatly uh, improving that. We have automatic controls that can make sure that you're, you're not over humidifying, which can present things like con prevent condensation on windows and, and stuff of that nature. Um, but, you know, ultimately it is going to come down to the maintenance and education of the homeowner and the HVAC guy who's servicing that home. Uh, they need to pay attention to that equipment when they're in there. The maintenance is, is minimal, but it does need to be done. Um, humidifiers do have uh, on and off switches for the different times of months. And again, with an automatic control, they would, they would disengage anyway. Uh, but, you know, Chris, speak a little, uh, if you could just add a little bit to that about, you know, sort of the, the insurance that uh, these are not mold creating machines, right? They are, they, they humidify the air and that is their primary goal. Of course. Yeah. I mean, hands down, they're, they're, they're supposed to be installed and maintained accordingly. Uh, and you shouldn't have those kinds of issues. But I will speak as you were speaking, Joseph, it kind of took me back to my technician days and how many times I opened up a humidifier and just kind of seen what was going on in there. And I'm thinking, oh, shoot, you know, what's going on? Why is this happening? And then I would go talk to the customer and they'd be like, I had no idea I even had a humidifier. <laughs> so there, there, there is an education standpoint from the field side that when we are in a home and we see a humidifier that we need to make sure that we're talking to, making sure that it's, it's operating correctly, it's maintained accordingly mm -hmm. to drive what it's performing to do. Because I think that's a perception. Uh, I think that's a fair perception because we've probably seen it at some point, whether it was a story or it was a picture you know, it kind of goes back in time a little bit about, well, moisture in a duct system is not good. Well, here's the challenge. If moisture, if we keep thinking of moisture as physical water, we're probably never going to be able to overcome that perception. 
that if we get the right system, the right installation, and it's operating and performing, that's absorbed. That's a vapor that's in the air that's mixed and blended. The only way it would ever recondense into a liquid is by a dew point temperature. If, if we were mm -hmm. to start to talk back about that, mm -hmm. um, and that's and that's something that goes back to the installation and, and maintenance side of things. So I, it's it's understanding it fully. I think that maintenance side is key, and you know, for all green certified homes and all homes in general, we need a maintenance manual, right? That tells us how to operate it, maintain it, like anything. I didn't know I had a furnace filter. I didn't know I had a bath fan, right? I mean, I know it's there, but I didn't know I needed to clean it. So we always recommend making sure when you do the renovation, you do a project, have that maintenance manual. And I'm excited because I'll be going into my second season with my April air um, humidifier, which really helped me a lot last year. And, you know, just to feel comfortable, I have the HVAC coming over to change the filter and kind of take a look at it. And I'm going to put it on film and put it into my maintenance manual for my house if I ever sell it someday. And then I have it right there. I can see what they're doing and go, oh, now I feel comfortable, you know, changing this thing because I think that'll be really cool. So I'm, they're going to be coming here to, to take a look at that. But, you know, looking at, you know, thinking about the duct systems, you know, a lot of our, you know, newer homes, we're still kind of beating our heads against a wall to not get people to, you know, the HVAC to pan the joists, right? But in all these older homes, we have all these pan joists, we have leaky ducts. Is there any impact or risk for mold when you have pan joys and or, well, inherently you typically have leaky ducts then too, uh, or distribution of it happening? What can you speak to a little bit about the importance of our uh, duct system being airtight? You talked about airtightness of the home, but what about the duct system? So that's, that, that's a fair question, Brett. And the, the panning for the return shouldn't really have an impact of what the humidifier is doing and how it's performing because we're, we're centralized to the, the system at itself, the return drop or the supply and the equipment. Um, so by the time that that air has traveled through the panning into the main central duct system and back, now we're starting to get that distribution um, or, or excuse me, that conditioning to distribute that through the HVAC equipment. So I'm, I'm not overly concerned about that. Leaky ducts though, yeah, how does that impact the overall performance, not only from a humidifier, but to the equipment? And that's something that has come to the forefront to the contractors as well is, well, why does this even really matter? Well, it does matter because if you're installing and specifying to a specific performance and you're not looking at this stuff, you're not meeting those performance requirements and you can put any product or, or manufacturer into that category uh, that, that would meet within that, in that duct system. And it's, it's mind blowing when you see 25, 30% duct leakage. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know what system is going to work effectively when you got that kind of leakage rate versus getting it down more into that acceptable range uh, of, you know, four to eight percent ish somewhere around there. Yeah, thanks for, for, for clarifying on that side of things. Um, let's talk about water conservation for a second here. You know, the five pillars, if you've been following us, you know, we talk about the five pillars of green building. And this is a healthy, this is a session about health, very important. But water conservation, we can't forget about it. Now we're taking water, putting it in there. We're using water, we're drawing water down. I live in an area, believe it or not, I'm next to Lake Michigan, but I'm running out of water. It's very concerning to me. What are ways that your system can help ensure yet, yes, we're staying, you know, we're getting the appropriate health, but that we're not wasting water doing it. Is that even possible? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Completely possible. And, and that was oftentimes what some things that I heard in the field too, is why is I, why do I always hear water running down the drain? Uh, and, and from a basic evaporative type of humidifier, that's all part of the process. The solenoid valve opens. It allows the water to hit a distribution tray. The distribution tray allows mm -hmm. the water to cascade down a conditioned water panel. The air passes through, and that's where your humidification takes place. Whatever is not used in that process is then released down the drain. Yeah. And that has often been looked at as, okay, well, how much of an impact from a water conservation does that have? So being innovative and getting to where we want to go, we offer a a completely mm -hmm. 
100% drainless unit. So we're gonna use all the water that the evaporative humidifier produces. Uh, we have a wicking style media where it's gonna absorb, it's gonna shut the solenoid valve off. That way we're not wasting water in any way or shape or form. Uh, so that's one method of doing that. But maintenance is absolutely critical with that one because we're holding water, we're absorbing, we're uh, refilling. So we've got this, this vicious cycle going on. So maintenance is absolutely critical. But that's where I, it probably one of the reasons, I don't know if it's the top reason, but it's probably one of the top couple reasons of why people have moved on to steam. They're getting a much better performance of the, the production of it. But then you don't have that water draining constantly down the drain because we're going to especially our technology, we're gonna maximize the water that's in our canister to measure it and look at it and say, okay, we need to add a little bit of water. We're gonna keep maximizing the performance of the water that we have before we just go ahead and dump it down. And, and again, I think that's one of the leading reasons why steam humidification has become much more viable in a solution-based offering in humidification. So you're, so you're saying the steam ones are actually more water efficient? You can get more yeah. water efficient. Uh, that's interesting. You know, I actually have a, a real-time water um, meter that I had installed the same time last year, uh, and it gives me reports and everything. Pretty cool, like energy monitoring uh, that I had installed like the same time uh, the April air. And I'll tell you, I you know I don't have a steam one, but I can't even tell from what I can tell from the real-time meter. I could not tell there was any additional water usage in my house. Um, using just a, you know, a, a traditional humidification system. So it was pretty, pretty cool to see that. I think one thing to add to that and, and Chris can add to it is, I mean, you know, if you look back at the application charts that Chris had up, the amount of water we're using, I mean, compared to a single toilet flush or one dishwasher run, I mean, you know, it's not even comparable. So you yeah. certainly don't ever want to see water go down the drain, but um, you know, it's not gallons upon gallons of it. Right. I mean, most of it is being, uh, uh, you know, effectively turned into vapor and sent to the rest right. of the well, let's talk heat pumps real quick. Uh, furnaces, you know, cooling first and then move into water heater. Um, so we're seeing a transition to electrification and heat pump systems, um, air source heat pump systems. And so we know that the furnace, it dries the air out, right? That's the biggest culprit is that furnace. But if we switch to a heat pump to heat the air, is there any change? Does it get worse? Does it get better? What have you seen out there as far as, you know, drying out the air in the wintertime um, with these electric systems? Going to a heat pump system, your output temperature is, is definitely impacted. Um, not that it's not going to heat the house, and that's not what I'm alluding to. But if you remember the chart that I shared that showed at 120 degrees, this mm -hmm. was our gallons per day. At 140 degrees, this was our gallons per day. Mm -hmm. Well, if we kind of back that down a little bit, we start to go down to 100 degrees, the capacity would change. So what you would need is you would need a higher performing humidifier when you have a lower temperature that we're relying on that evaporation to take place. Mm. And that's probably going back into the, maybe another top reason why steam. Steam doesn't, it, it does care what the temperature is for absorption. Mm -hmm. But in the actual production of the humidification, it doesn't necessarily care what the temperature is. That mm -hmm. then becomes how much is how much time do I need to absorb the steam into the air at 100% mm -hmm. versus evaporative? We're looking at what's the temperature to maximize the evaporation to create the humidifier. Uh, so when we start talking about geothermal, whether it's it's uh, you know an in the ground system or we talk about an air-to-air -air heat pump system, when we have that lower output temperature, we, we really wanna make sure that we're looking at the capacity that is needed to fulfill the house's requirement. And that's probably another leader for, for steam in the, in the game. Hmm. Interesting, yeah, I did not know that. Um, so I, 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 you know, I have a heat pump water heater and I was surprised when I took a look, they tied the you know, humidification system right into it. I see the pipe coming out. Why did they do that? Is that normal for heat pump water heaters or just, is that something they do for any kind of water heater? Where, where did they tie it in exactly? Is it off your cold water side, your hot water side? Oh, that's a good question. I should know the answer to that one. I haven't uh, dove into it. I think it's coming off of the hot water pipe though. Yeah, when we look at performance and how that evaporation takes place on the evaporative type humidifiers, 
maximizing a cold air, air temperature. So one of the things I really didn't get into detail uh, about on the control side is we can also have a call for humidity when there isn't a call for heat. We want to maximize that any time because that's the mm -hmm. optimum time to humidify. Mm -hmm. But if it's a shoulder day where it's not extremely cold outside and we're not getting the run time, we have a test feature in our controls that will then turn on the humidifier, uh, test that relative humidity that's in the air, and then says, okay, we need to actually humidify the air. And if we've got a colder air temperature, that hot water will help that evaporation process uh, get up there as quickly as possible. But if we have a high temperature, so Brett, do you have a gas furnace on top of it? No, you said heat pump, right? Yeah, oh yeah, a heat pump, yep, yep. <laughs> okay. yeah. So we wanna make sure with that cooler temperature that hot water is gonna accelerate the process of, mm. of, of uh, humidification through an evaporative. Right. Um, and then just real quick, you had mentioned, I thought you had said something earlier about um, the, the sort of perfect comfort, comfort zone being connected to the ASHRAE 52 standard, but then I saw on the screen, it said ASHRAE 55. Could you just clarify which standard it was that has, uh, that you had mentioned? Yeah, the, um, the psychometrics for temperature is, is 55. 55, okay. 52 is your air cleaner. Air cleaner. Okay. Yeah, so you, so you were talking about 55, which was displayed on the screen. Yes. Okay. For some reason, I thought I had heard 52. So I just wanted to make sure. I, had I, might, I might have said 52. I always have 52, 55, and yeah. 62. Those are the ones that are always stuck in my head. So if I did. Right. My mom, yeah. And I've got two, one, two, two, 91. <laughs> now I got 55. Oh no. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, Joe, did you see any other questions while we were going through this, or it looked like more just some chatter there on the in the commentary? So, <laughs> yeah, no, um, I nothing worth a deep dive here. Somebody did ask about hard water. I get uh, the water oh, yeah. is going to be it um, something to consider when you're doing the installation application. I, I shouldn't it shouldn't be something for you to consider, but certainly the installing contractor. Um, hard or soft water will both work uh, to an extent. Chris can maybe speak quickly on the preferences. If you have a steam humidifier, you do need some minerals in there for that conductivity to actually occur and generate the steam. So you wouldn't want like RO water or something like that going into the steam humidifier. But um, other than that, uh, Chris, really the biggest impact on performance is probably just going to be perhaps the amount of scale and how quickly it builds up, correct? Whether you're using hard or soft. And, and do we have a recommendation? If you have a soft water, do you want it in, in front of or behind that? No, you, you, you pretty much covered it, Joseph. From an evaporative side, we really don't care what the quality of the water is, whether it's hard nor soft, um, because we're just using that, that evaporation method of cascading in, in the air temperature. But on the steam side, it's, that is one of the critical elements of how quickly that will produce steam is if we have a harder based water, uh, there's a lot of mineral content. So we're gonna drive activity. We're gonna be able to generate steam very effectively. Now, like you said, Joseph, the scale of the electrode, it might not last as long or it might, it all depends. It all depends on the runtime. If I have a soft water, soft water is okay with either system. It's when I have a a reverse osmosis or a natural water that really doesn't have any conductivity at all from the mineral standpoint, we wanna make sure that we're tapping in prior to that system. So get it where it's coming into the home. Um, otherwise, you've, if, if you're familiar, maybe you've heard, we've had to add salt sometimes to canisters to get them to start generating. That, that's usually a, an indication that that water is pretty soft and there's not a whole lot of activity in it. And we, we do have an LC canister too for areas like Toronto where the water is uh, particularly void of minerals. Good touch point. Yep. Well, um, we are uh, a little bit over our time, but we had a lot of great stuff to talk about, a lot of great conversation. Um, Chris, I think we're going to have you back out in a little while for talking about um, dehumidification, right? Uh, maybe on Perfect. the cusp of uh, summer as things start to... Uh, Right now, I know right now it's, it is humid. <laughs> so it is, it wouldn't have been a bad time for me to talk about it because it is certainly still humid here, but we're heading into that winter season. And so we'll catch up with you all on the next one. But in the, in the meantime, Chris, where can people go to contact you or learn more if they want to, um, you know, understand humidification and opportunities better? So. 
Yeah, we've got some really good uh, platforms, whether it's it's on um, on the website, you can go to aprilairpartners.com. There's a lot of really good information there that they can dig into. We have an app as well, a healthy home app uh, that has a lot of good information, whether it's technical or sales on that. Um, or you guys in, in the, uh, the handout, my contact information's there. I'm open to conversations any day, every day. You could send me an email, phone, or text message. Anytime. So I appreciate it. All right. Well, um, uh, Chris Howells, uh, Joe Hillenmeyer, thank you all so much for taking your time to help educate all of us here. Really appreciate you and appreciate April Air for all your support and allowing us to do what we do. And as a reminder, everyone, we can use building science to help uh, stymie the pandemic. So let's ventilate, let's filter, let's humidify where we can. We know it'll make a big difference. Mask up where you can get vaccinated. We want to see you all in person. We want to be safe. We want to be healthy. That's what we want to do. So take care, be well, and we'll see you next week. Goodbye. Be sure to check out all of our courses available online that you can watch anytime and anywhere to pick up your CEUs. Before you go, make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube to get weekly updates and stay up to date on green building science courses, webinars, and home tours. Thanks again.